We will be in Genesis chapter 6 today, verses 1 through 8. So if you have a Bible or you can pull it up on your screen or your device, Genesis 6, 1 through 8. Thank you, Charlie. In a couple of weeks, I'll be riding my bike across the state of Iowa. And some of you are like, why, why on earth would you do that? Uh, Iowa is my home state. There is a ride, an annual ride that takes place with your, it begins with your rear tire of your bike in the Missouri River, and it ends with the front tire of your bike in the Mississippi River. It's not a race, but anything I do is a competition, so it, I, I might make it a race. But it's 500 miles across the state, and I'm doing that in a couple of weeks, so if you're wondering where I am, uh, pray for me <laughs> that I make it back. Part of preparing for that ride is I'm, I'm riding the roads around Phoenix. Now, I've, I've gotten off the roads, had some close calls with cars. Bikes and cars don't uh, mix well in Phoenix. And so I'm riding the canals. And there's hundreds of miles of canal bike trails throughout Phoenix. When I go early in the morning, as I did yesterday morning, it takes me uh, a long Bass Pro shop there on the, the 202 and then takes me to Tempe Town Lake. And it's about a 15-mile stretch. In those 15 miles, there are, I counted yesterday, over 100 people who God loves, who God created, who are made in the image of him. And they're laying there on the along the canal, on the bike trail, strung out, maybe drunk, naked, muttering to themselves, hot, laying on concrete, laying on gravel, laying in filth, and I'm flying by him on my bike. And for a second, I confess to you that the thought crossed my mind, somehow I am better than they are. And then immediately the Holy Spirit convicted me. There's a passage, even though we're going to look at Romans 6 today, there's a passage in Romans 3. Let me just read it for you. Paul writes in Romans 3, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands and there is no one who seeks God. All have turned away, and they have together become worthless. Some strong language. There is no one who does good, not even one. We've been introduced to sin the last couple of weeks, and sin plays no favorites. There is an equalitarianism to sin that we're all depraved. There isn't any good in us. Like, well, I've seen humans do good things. That has been granted to us even by God. The fact that we do anything good is because of God moving and God working. I don't know if you've ever had a thought in your life that you are better than someone else. I don't know if you've ever had a thought in your life that someone is better than you. That is not biblical. The truth of God's word says we, are, we all fall short. And except for the grace of God, so go I. Genesis chapter 6 is a sobering passage. It's a challenging passage. It's a passage we're not going to skip over today. But Genesis 6 verse 1. When man began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive. They took as their wives any they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days. And also afterwards, when the sons of God came into the daughters of man and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. 
verse 5, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. In verse 8, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Next week, we'll look at the flood account, Noah and the ark, and often the familiar story. The unfamiliar story is chapter 6. And I have to tell you, I don't have all the answers here today. When you approach a complicated subject, and per square inch, this might be one of the most debated texts in all of Scripture. There's so many questions here. And oftentimes, we can really get sidetracked by the controversy of this text. It's good to study Scripture. But if, if our pontification of Scripture dis, dis, detracts us from really what God wants us to do, action-oriented, the greatest commandment is to love God and love people. If Scripture does not do that, then somehow we've gone off course. So study the passage, so let's look at it, but we're not going to stay there forever. There's some uh, thoughts on the passage here today. Who are the sons of God and who are the daughters of men? This passage kind of rose its head in the last few years with all that happened in our culture and our society and the DNA structure are vaccines impacting the DNA structure and Satan's out to change the DNA structure and all that? So this kind of came to light the last few years. There's been a lot more attention and thought. And, but let me ask you, is your Bible reading and your Bible study causing you to love God more and love people more? Or is it causing you to be more divisive? Is it causing you to be a distraction? That's a, that's a question we should always ask when we come to a text. Study the text. Know the text. There are some things we may not know completely. And as I studied this text, there are some really good, godly people who disagree on this. And so when we come to the text, come to the text, anytime you come to the text, come to the text, right, with humility. Really important. When you come to Bible study, come with humility. Like maybe... I might be missing something here. Listen, what I believe about Scripture is different than 30 years ago. There's been some things I've, I've changed on. And so be patient with people. Where you are at, maybe you've, you've figured out some things and you believe that you're really, really right. Well, it took you some time to get there, so be patient with others who are figuring this out. All right, those are my footnotes on Genesis chapter 6. Deal? Man began to multiply, so they were obedient. Mankind, if we look at chapter 5, mankind lived a long time. Uh, you look at the genealogy of chapter 5, and just a couple of notes on chapter 5. Um, lifespan, and these are real years. Some people would believe this to be months. So maybe they weren't that old. Well, if that was the case, then they'd be having children at like age 3. So that's not the case. Lifespan decreased gradually after the flood from the 900s, in Genesis 5, to the 600s, Shem, in chapter 11, 10 through 11, to the 400s, so we're getting younger, Salah, chapter 11, verse 14, to the 200s, Ru, lived to be 200. Biologically, there's no re reason humans could not live hundreds of years. Scientists today are more baffled by the concept of aging than of, of living long, than of longevity. And the Bible is not alone in speaking of hundreds of years of lifespans among the ancients. There's records among the Greeks and the Egyptians of people living hundreds of years. Psalm 90 verse 10 tells us that man's years will be around 70 to 80. And that was written thousands of years ago. Is that still true? Yeah, pretty, pretty much. Between 70 and 80 is the average lifespan. I think women are a couple years older live longer than men because 
They make better decisions probably throughout the course of their life. Some say there in chapter 6 that our lifespan is 120. But in the text, what Moses is saying is they have 120 years left. So how long did it take Noah to build the ark? 120 years. So man had 120 years left. If you've ever read that and thought, well, that's how long man's going to live now. Well, I haven't. I don't know anybody who's lived to be 120. Have, have you? 70, 80 is, is, is more like it. And so they're multiplying. And well, let me just say, the longer man lives, there's more sin abounds. If evil exists in mankind's heart, the longer mankind lives, the more wicked humanity gets. Think, think about it. A wicked person can do a lot of damage in 70 to 80 years. How much damage can a wicked person do in 900 years? Now, also, they can multiply. There's a lot of children that can be born if you live to be 900 years. Population explosion. Some say the population on Earth at this time was 17 billion. Now, I grew up thinking, you know, when the flood happened, oh, there weren't that many people on Earth. But if people are living close to 1,000 years, you can have a lot of children. Think of the family reunions. <laughs> You'd have to, whole expo centers to, to rent out, a, to have a family reunion. And then you have one passage there in chapter 5 before we get to 6. Uh, you have Enoch. Enoch was no more. There's a few people who did not experience death in Scripture. Elijah. Uh, and Enoch, and then you've got a couple people who died twice. They had to experience death twice. Think of Lazarus. Everybody celebrates Lazarus for resurrection. Well, the poor guy had to die again, right? <laughs> you think of uh, the, the widow's son of Nain, who Jesus rose. Jairus' daughter, Jesus rose. So some people had to experience death twice. And then there were a couple who never experienced death. We see Enoch there. He was, and then he was no more. So we see the length of mankind getting shorter. Why? Because mankind was wicked, and God's limiting their days. But yet, he's still patient. So the sons of God saw the daughters of men. So who are the sons of God? The sons of God are mentioned four to five times throughout Scripture. Even though Adam is considered a child of God, even though you're considered a child of God. There's many passages of Scripture that reference us to God is our Father and we are his children. Never is the word sons of God referenced to humans. Right? But the Son of God, which is Jesus. Outside of that, every time sons of God are referenced, it's referring to angelic beings demons, fallen angels, angelic beings. So sons of God, let me give you a, a couple passages. If you're familiar with the story of Daniel, Daniel had some friends, uh, Rakshak and Benny is how I remember it, but uh, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. And the, those three were thrown into the fiery furnace. Now, when they were thrown into there, there was a fourth figure in the fiery furnace. I believe that fourth person to be the son of God, Jesus. But that same term is applied to that fourth figure as a son of God. And a spiritual being was, was there. When God questions Job, Job chapter 38, he says, Job, were you there when I created the heavens and the earth? Were you there when the sons of God shouted for joy? Sons of God referring to angels. Those are the only times this phrase, sons of God, are mentioned, referring to angelic beings. Now, the other theory is that you look at the two lines of Seth, sons of God are the descendants of Seth, and then the daughters of men are, are women from the line of Cain. And so one popular belief is that this, the, the line of Seth and the line of Cain, they intermarried and created wickedness, went against what God had, had said. Those are the two popular, most popular, most common held beliefs, sons of God and daughters of men. The third one, which is less popular, is superhero status. These are 
mythological creatures. And similar to like we refer to when a, when a man runs into a house or a woman runs into a house and saves a, saves a cat from being burned, well, that person was a hero, right? We use, we use phrases like that. So the sons of God, daughters of men, I'm ascribing to you that these are angelic beings, fallen angels that have had sex. Now, Scripture tells us had sex with women on earth. Now, Scripture tells us angels don't marry, but these aren't angels anymore. These are fallen angels. They're no longer in their, in heaven, so they're here on earth. And when, what is Satan trying to do here? Satan is trying to do, if you remember the pro-evangelium that we looked at a few weeks ago, the first time we see the gospel in Genesis chapter 3, there's a prophecy given that one day the seed of a woman will be Jesus. Right? Jesus is going to come. The Messiah is going to come. The Redeemer is going to come. He's going to defeat Satan. So from that point on, Satan's goal is to make sure that Redeemer does not come. And many believe that this is his attempt to destroy the seed of the woman, which is, which is Jesus, eventually. Now, Satan failed, as he does all the time. Satan failed in his attempt. Now, what's the straw that broke the camel's back in Genesis 6? Now, God's referred to here in this passage as being sorry, as having regret. These are human terms that we can understand, we can relate to. I believe our God is a God of feeling, but he is not a God that changes his mind. You and I change our mind. We've probably changed our mind 100 times today, 50 times deciding what to wear and whether or not to have baked items on the way in, on the way out. God doesn't change his mind. This was not a surprise to God. In fact, when the law was given to Adam and Eve, right, what was the purpose of the law? It was to reveal their sin. It's to reveal their sin. Rules and boundaries from God are not to tell us, it's not to keep us on track necessarily. It's also to reveal to us how much we are in need of a Savior, how great we are in need of a Savior. In the New Testament, just to finish up on the sons of God and the daughters of men, in the New Testament, there's two passages that refer to this text. One is in 2 Peter 2, telling the church that difficult days are coming. Difficult days are coming. Now, common thought today is, oh, Jesus is going to come back really soon. My dad's taught me that Ever, ever since I was a small child, my dad's always, Jesus is coming back. And you know what? You're not wrong if you think that. It's good to live on that side to be prepared for Jesus to return. But the idea that it is more wicked today than it's ever been, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call that one into question. Wickedness has always existed. Before the flood, it was wicked. I'm taking God at his word here. It was evil and it was wicked. And what was the greatest wickedness? What did Satan end up using? It was sexual perversion. Now all sin is, separates us from God. And I, I hear often, all, sin, all sins are equal. Yes, in the fact that they separate us from God. But there's something unique about sexual sins that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 6, 17. For sexual sin is a sin against the body. And there's consequences to sexual sins to other people, but also to the body as well. And if anybody's seen the movie here recently, The Sound of Freedom, it just articulates that the United States is one of the greatest marketplace for sexual perversion and immorality. It's wicked. What's happening to children today in the name of science and in the name of uh, children being bought and sold. I hiked through Nepal a couple years ago, and I went through towns where there were no children ages 8 to 18, no girls ages 8 to 18. They have all been taken. And people came and promised their family members money and jobs, and, and their girls leave the village and never come back. 
Yeah, it's, it's wicked. It's wicked. In all of this wickedness, God decides, I'm going to blot out sons of God from earth. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to blot mankind out. Now, we come to the end of Genesis 6, not the end, but verse 8. And through all of this, one thing I want you to know about, because I want you to leave today with good news. And the good news is God is so very patient. God, when that was written, when he decided to blot out mankind, he didn't do it that day. He gave mankind 120 years to repent. God is patient, not willing that any should perish. And we hear the story of Noah's flood, and sometimes we question, how can God be so wrathful and judgmental and, and kill everybody? He gave them 120 years. For, that's more than you and I have. We have, you and I have, about 70 to 80 years to repent. And some of you have done that, and you've experienced this word spelled K-H-E-N. It's a Hebrew word. It's the first time we see it in the Bible. And it's found in Genesis 6, verse 8. And do you know what the word is? Grace. It's in Hebrew, if you pronounce it, it's hen with a little at the front end of it. It's grace. The first time we see the word grace in Scripture, listen, this is really important, is after the description of how evil and wicked mankind is. That's when we need grace the most. When we recognize how evil, not that they are, how evil I am. No one seeks after God. And anyone who's ever been given grace, God found you. Grace found you. I think of a story when I was a small child. I was, this is a true story. I know all stories from dads begin like this. I walked uphill in the snow and it was cold and to the bus stop. I was in preschool and it was about three quarters of a mile. And I had to walk to the bus stop. And it was a blizzard. So it's like 7 a.m. and a blizzard's happening. And back then, before cell phones and texting, I didn't make it to school because I stopped at a neighbor's house halfway to the bus stop. And I was cold. And the neighbor took me in and made me soup. And it was, I had a great day. <laughs> in the meantime, my mom called the school and was looking for us. And she called Dad, and they're looking for us. And they send out a search party looking for me. I'm having soup. Baked pumpkin bread. I remember this day. It was, a, it was a good day. And my mom tells me the story years later that when they found me, when they went door to door and they found me in there, that what I said to her when they found me is, oh, mom, I found you. <laughs> now think of the ridiculousness of that statement. I didn't do anything. They found me. If you've somehow experienced the grace of God in your life, God found you. And there's oftentimes there's two ways to look at this, either to look at salvation, either I have earned God's grace. Somehow, by your good works, when you leave today, somehow there might be a little voice in your head that says somehow God's going to love you a little bit more because you came to church today. Somehow, because maybe you gave, you put a dollar in the offering, somehow God's going to love you a little bit more. That's one way to earn your salvation. Think that you earn your salvation. The other way is to, to go party hard, to run as far as, as you can away from, away from God. And biblically speaking, it's not this way. It's not the pharisaical way, the legalistic way. It doesn't earn you anything. And it's not this way. But when Jesus came to earth, you know who was attracted to him? Jesus is called a friend of sinners. They were not like him, but they liked him a lot. Why did they like him a lot? Because he saw them 
for who they were. He saw them as people made in the image of God. The sons of God and the daughters of men, the, the Nephilites. Talk, we haven't really dug into the Nephilites. Who are the Nephilites? Some people believe that these are the descendants of the sons of God and the daughters of men. But when you look at the text closely, Moses is actually demythologizing, demythologizing them. He's saying, look, you've read about them. You and everybody who read Genesis knew who the Nephilites were. Whoever you think they are, you have read about them. They are not a part of this story. And then Paul writes to Timothy, and this is really interesting. Paul says, do not argue over endless genealogies and foolish myths. And he writes the same thing to Titus as well. Because in the book of Enoch, there's long genealogies of the angels in the book of Enoch. And so there's extra biblical canonical scripture that they were studying and looking at. And they were getting distracted by endless genealogies and foolish myths. The most important text, Genesis 6, is verse 8 of this passage today. Among exploding population, among sexual perversion, among demonic activity, among constant evil in the heart of man, widespread corruption and violence, here's a verse that stands out. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Noah didn't find anything. Favor found him. God found Noah. And I don't know where you're at today in your relationship with God. I don't know what you've done. I don't know what you're currently doing. I don't know what's a secret in your life. I don't know what you're involved in. But place your name in place of Noah there. Sometime this week in your quiet time, put your name there but found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Grace is a wonderful thing. Grace is, is so needed. It's so desired. I've never met anyone who doesn't want grace to meet unconditional love meeting imperfection. And if you haven't, understood how much God loves you, he gives us a, a story, and I'll end with this. He gives us a story. It's in the book of Hosea, and I'll sum it up. God grabs Hosea, who's a prophet, and he says, I want, I want you to tell the nation how much I love you. And Hosea is like, all right, whatever it is, I'll do it. He's like, I want you to go marry a woman. Her name was Gopher. And I want you, I want you to marry her. And so he marries this woman, and this woman early on in their marriage, begins to run after other men. And she has affair after affair after affair, and she begins to have children. And he begins to name these children. One of the names that he names the children is, not my child. <laughs> that's not my child. But that, that was literally the name of the child, not my child. But he did what God asked. And then one of the men that she went after and was, have, was sleeping around with, decides to sell her. And you go into the town and you're able to bid on all the women standing on the block and they were stripped naked so you knew what commodity you were getting. And God says to Hosea, Hosea, I want you to go and buy her back. Now put yourself in his shoes. We get to talk about this story. This ruined Hosea's life, but we get to talk about this thousands of years later. Jose, I want you to bid on her. I want you to buy her back. So he does that. He buys her back. He takes a coat, wraps around her, and he brings her back home. Now, why does God have a prophet do that? God is telling. He's doing everything he can to tell his people how much he loves them. God said, I love you. I will buy you back. No matter what you've done, no matter what you're currently doing, no matter what you're involved in, no matter what secret part of your life is hidden, God says, I want to buy you back. You're worth it to me. I will pay whatever it takes. And the word for grace 
in Hebrew is that of a necklace, a beautiful necklace wrapped around a beautiful woman. That is the word of grace. He buys her back. He brings her home. And he stays married to her. And God says, that's a picture of how much I love you. That's a picture of how much I love the wicked people of the world. And before I look out there, I look at me. For I am the wicked people. It is really easy to think it's about them. Oh, the world is so wicked and evil, and Jesus, you need to come back. Here, here's my caution with that. If Jesus came back two weeks ago, seven kids from camp would not have met their Savior. Every day Jesus tarries is another opportunity for you to share the good news with somebody else. Yeah, we want Jesus to return. I would love to see that in my lifetime. But he has been patient for a couple thousand years. And there are people on this earth who do not know Jesus. And he is waiting. And what an opportunity we have, Boulder Mountain, to not waste a day without sharing the gospel. And I'm so grateful that through your generosity, we're able to impact locally, but also globally. There are people who do not know Jesus. And yes, they are wicked as I am wicked. The difference is grace has found me. Grace is available to them. They just don't know it yet. And it's our job. We've been invited to share that with them. Would you pray with me? God, thank you for this text this morning. It's difficult. It's mysterious. There's some things in this passage we're not fully aware of, but I thank you for verse 8. At the first time we see grace mentioned in Scripture is after our wickedness shows up onto the scene. God, I pray as we sing, as we come to the altar, that Holy Spirit, you would move in our hearts and our minds this morning. Only you know what everybody's thinking, what's on the hearts, what, what's happening behind closed doors. And I pray, God, that grace would find them today. That grace would find all of us. We'd all be reminded of what grace is, undeserved, unearned favor and kindness this morning. Thank you for your goodness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm so glad that you joined us for today's service. Let me leave you with a few next steps that you can take. Number one, let us know that you're participating online. You can make a comment there in the notes. You can send me an email or you can give the church a call. Just let us know. We'd love to add you to our email list that updates our people on what is happening in the life of the church. Number two, if there's something I can specifically be praying for you about, I can give that prayer request. I will pray for you, but I can also give that to our prayer team. A third next step that you can take, if you've been encouraged by the ministry of Boulder Mountain, even though you've maybe never been here physically, uh, let me encourage you to give. We believe that giving teaches us contentment. When we recognize that God's been generous to us, so at Boulder Mountain, we give first, we save second, then we live on the rest. So there's an opportunity for you to participate in giving through our church website. If there's anything else that I can be doing for you or, or Boulder Mountain can do for you by sending you resources, simply let us know. Otherwise, let me pray for you as we close our service. And so for those, Father, who are not here in the room, we recognize church is not a building we come and sit in. So wherever they are at, we know and we believe that, Jesus, you are with them. So I pray that they would sense your presence and your power. Holy Spirit, give them the wisdom to know what to do, and then give them the courage to do it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you this week.